two. Hello, I'm just giving double checking to make sure. Ah, there's so many little screens here that I wanted to make sure that I knew who was here and what's going on and all that jazz. Thank you everyone for attending this presentation. My name's Mildred Katie. I'm a um, major science fiction fantasy fan and uh, sometimes creator. I have been gaming in some form or fashion for 30 plus years now. Um, and this presentation came out of a panel last year where uh, I forgot what brought it up, but the, I, we were talking about online gaming and I had brought up things like how some of the technology that we're using now has a much deeper history and goes back quite a ways. And I thought it had turned into a panel for this year. Turns out it turned into a presentation. So here we are. Uh, so thank you all for joining. Um, I'm going to switch over. I do have the ability for a, um, there is a question and answer option um if you if you have your menu bar down at the bottom you will see a q a button and also a chat button feel free to um, make comments answer questions but i may be answering the questions more at the end of this than anything and i am going to make sure i set myself a timer because as my trainer for my new job at Starbucks mentioned and when she noticed that I love to tell stories. So I want to make sure that we do get a chance to uh, talk about any questions or comments that people have. So I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. Make sure I can see everything. All right. Well, I, is it showing? All right. Awesome. All right. So, as I mentioned in the intro, what we think of as gaming these days has <laughs> um, the technology behind it has a very, very long tradition. Most of what we think of as the main predecessors to electronic games are actually from, starts in about the 1940s, but there are some things that go back even further than that. Um, the idea of the arcade is very long, goes back into the 1800s. Um, where arcades used to also be shopping centers and in some places they still are where i used to live before i moved to boston the boston area um, one of our theaters the is in an old arcade where the theater's one side there used to be shops on both sides of the walkway in between and they still have a little bit of that feeling. Then you also have traveling shows with um, and small amusement parks and those games that you would get like carnival games and such. Then certain aspects of those get brought into the arcades and um, we have your like your ski ball machines, your ball toss, um, 
there's like little fortune telling machines. And after each of these slides, I also have slides of photos of different um, different things mentioned on the previous slide. Um, also, there's a lot of like early films actually start in these arcades too, where uh, companies would build little stereo like viewfinder type machines that did a flip book style movie. Um, I was able to see a lot of these machines at this place called the Musée Mécanique in Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. And there was a fire in that area this morning and I'm hoping everything's all right. Um, but these machines cover a wide range. Uh, you've got little dioramas where one of the oldest machines they have is a diorama. So like think of a um, little model of a prairie wagon and the only thing that happens when you drop the quarter in is that a fan turns on and starts blowing some of the stuff in the background. And that's one of the oldest machines. I wanna say it uh, was 1860 something. Pinball is another arcade favorite, and our pinball itself has been around since the 1880s, sorry, 1830s, but coin-operated machines really started coming into play earlier, uh, earlier in the 20th century. Now, one of the things that has always fascinated me about technology is how imagination fuels it. And I found a couple of examples of what we now either completely accept like cell phones or are still in the process of getting used to being thought of by people centuries before now. So, um, Cell phones actually have some basis in the 18, early 1800s. And Frank L. Frank Baum, who most people know as the writer for Wizard of Oz, actually had an idea that is basically an augmented reality goggle. And um, so here's just the picture of a few things. Now, the technology involved changes from everything, just you put in a quarter and the answer pops up in a window. And like the next generation of the fortune telling machine was, it would then spit out a pre-printed card. And now you get little on-demand printed tape, as it were, um, when you put in your quarter. Also, little Nickelodeon machines were really popular. This 18, particularly in the San Francisco area, there's a lot, there were a lot of these 1906 earthquake and fire video machines. Um, this picture in the lower right hand corner is from um, 1826, um, after some of the first public tests of a wireless telephone uh, system were being introduced, where the idea was in the future, everyone's going to be wearing these almost like Star Trek little devices on their coats with a little receiver that you could listen to. Your, um, like make your phone call through. Um, the Frank L. Baum I was, uh, idea, I was looking for an image and couldn't find it, but that particular device apparently looked just like regular glasses and they had the power to, when the user wore them, when they looked at a person, they would see a letter on their forehead, G for good people, E for evil people, A for kind people, C for cruel people, and that there was some way that a, bo a person's body had 
an electrical field that could sh that corresponded with who they were and the glasses were set up so that um, it could read that energy field and then tell the user what the person was like. And I found that absolutely fascinating and well, could be pretty expected from L. Frank Baum. So into the nitty gritty. Um, some of what we, the first official, well, sorry, I do need to step back. The definition of a video game, an electronic game, a computer game. So technically a video game is limited to any game that is, takes electronic input and the output is presented on a CRT screen. Um, that really hasn't been much the case since somewhere in the 1980s, well, late 80s, early 90s, there was already a transition into digital formats. And so technically any computer game on a non-CRT screen is technically not a video game. So most people these days have kind of thrown that particular definition to the side and, and have sort of combined the idea of the video game being something that's only on a CRT, an electronic game just being a game where the input and output is determined by electronics and a computer game being, okay, you have this computer device and you play the game on it. And it's all been merged into this big, huge conglomeration. The original games were more electronic games because first of all, it took a little while to develop the CRT. So before that, it's all physical electronics that are being used. And a couple of the first best known games are actually both based on the game of NIM, which is a mathematical strategy game. And the first one, the Nimitron, I've got a picture on it, a couple pictures actually on the next slide, where it's, it's, this thing is huge. It is taller than a person and all it is is a set of switches and lights. But it also, while being one of the first electronic games, is also one of the first electronic spectator games because when they set this up, it was for the World's Fair, so they wanted everyone to be able to see it in ooh and awe, and I'm waiting in line, what's going on ahead of me? They built it with a set of panels that showed the game in progress with a similar set of lights. Now, because the game of NIM is set up in a way that, um, if you know the strategy behind it, it's very easy to win, the game had the computer had like a 90% win rate, which was probably disappointing to all those thousands of people be, who played on it during that World's Fair. It was there for only like a couple of months and it played about a thousand, ten, sorry, a hundred thousand games. Now, I have a picture of the next item, which is the cathode ray amusement tube. And this is one of the first first person shooter games. So things that we see now at, in terms of game categories have been around for quite a while. So on the left side of the screen, we've got the Nim, uh, the Nimitron and the, it in use, and you can get pictures of all the patents for this. And it's that box is all mechanical relays. 
And on the right is that cathode ray amusement device. So basically you set like your trajectories and everything, pull the switch, and then it would process and show the results on the screen. Now this is one kind of technically the first video game because the display is a CRT. And then we start sliding into the 1950s. And as the technology develops, everything starts snowballing. So we only have a couple of things in the 1940s, a couple of practical, actually in use devices, some theoretical stuff. Um, I forgot to mention the Alan Turing writing a um writing a chess program that was so advanced they couldn't actually play it on the machines available at the time and i'm trying i have been trying to find out if someone has updated it so that they could try to run it now and so far i'm not seeing anyone who's done it but i'm certain that there's some enterprising computer historian out there who might want to jump on that opportunity. So at this time, most computers are big, huge rooms of computer rather than a something that can fit on or on your desk. And as you'll see in the next in the next slide with photos, some of these devices for something as what is simple as tic-tac-toe are bigger than my husband's concert grand piano. Um, and they captured everyone's imagination. Um, and so a lot of these colleges, institutions, um, the include all, research, the military, they were developing, when they were developing the computer programs, there was the, all right, we want to accomplish X task, and that's why we're writing this program. But there was also a trend to, we want to show off what the machine can do, your average person may not be interested in all the calculations that go into something or um, trajectories or this, that, or the other thing, but we can write simple games and that's a way of showing it, the technology off to someone who might not otherwise be interested. So that big cabinet machine that was playing the game of NIM in the previous decade gets an update and renamed to Nimrod by a different developer. And that machine was set up so that they could actually slow down the calculations so that like as you're playing, you can see how the computer is calculating its move. which I thought was a very, very accessible way of presenting this big, huge machine. Now, of course, the military has to get involved. If there's anyone surprised at this concept, um, I do have to wonder because first of all, programmers get bored, whether or not they're in the military or in, in civilian life. So the first blackjack program was developed by the laboratories that developed the atomic bomb. Yes, they had to do something in their off time. And like with role-playing games where there is a very well-established tradition of military scenario play. 
um, the military started designing games to do the same thing. Well, you could either call it a game or you could call it a simulation. Either which way, the one that they developed in 1955, um, big air quotes, proved that the United States would win a nuclear war against Russia if it were to happen. Um, oh, cool. Uh, so in the, I just noticed in the chat, someone uh, posted a link to a online simulation of the Nimitron. So um, if, if you want to give that a shot, go right ahead. Oh, only one to me? All right. Oh, it's, it says panelists and all attendees. All right. If you can't see it, I will make sure at the end that I copy it and people can see that. Um, in 1956, there's a checkers program that Arthur Samuel demonstrates. And the, my husband said he couldn't see it. So, and I can actually hear him. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, and another trend that happens is computer people write a program to play a game. And at some point in the future, it beats a nationally known master of that particular game. Yes, uh, Deep Blue is mentioned later, but the first time is actually in the 50s and early 60s with checkers. Um, and oh again a lot of these programs are to really demonstrate what the computer can do in an accessible way um i was tickled pink at finding the uh mouse in the maze game it was developed in mit and what they would do is um, use a light pen to set up the walls of the maze and then let the mouse run through it to find either cheese or margaritas. Apparently margaritas were a big thing among the Tech Model Railroad Club. If I ever get a chance to meet any of these gentlemen, I will A, introduce them to my brother who's a rail fan and B, ask them what the margarita recipe was. So, A lot of these computers got a bunch of exposure by being on television because, hey, big, huge, fancy thing, let's show it on television. And if you do not recognize the gentleman in the upper um, left-hand corner, that is a um, comedian by the name of Danny Kay. He won against Birdie the Brain, which was a tic-tac-toe simulator. In the lower left-hand corner, that big, huge kind of double-sided machine that is the Goodyear Electronic Differential Analyzer, which is the system that hooks feel that, yeah, we're going to win a nuclear war against Russia game was played on. Um, the upper right is a game called OXO that uh, was written in 1952. Um, had its own little machine, but uh, found a uh, screenshot of an emulator, um, actually a Mac emulator for this program. <laughs> um, and that's what that screenshot's from. And then lower right hand corner is a simulation of that MIT mouse in the maze game. Unfortunately, they did not decide to show the margarita icon. They only showed the cheese icon. In the 60s, we now start getting to the point where I have to go to multiple slides for some of the timeline stuff. But again, there's a lot of the same thing going on in the 60s where it's like, hey, we have a, we have this computer, how do we show it off? Um, or, as I know among many of my programmer friends, I was sick, I was bored, 
I wrote something off the fly. And that is a trend that continued, that's present in the 60s and continues through to current day. Uh, a number of these games become the basis for games we see in the future. Like Space Warp in 1962, we will see, which is a completely computer based video game, we will see that pop up later in an in a actual arcade game just under a different name. Um, basic, uh, the release of the basic programming system allows for a lot of Sorry, BASIC is not a computer program, it's a programming language. The release of BASIC allows a lot of people who didn't have access to computer programs before to start playing. And we start getting a lot of kind of these days where you could go on to the Apple store or um, Google Play or something and find a million and a half games written by some guy or girl or other person in their basement. That's been a thing for decades as well. Um, <coughs> and in the mid 60s is when we start getting the idea of uh, for count. Um, of specific game consoles. So Ralph Bayer develops a brown box gaming console, which I have a picture of in the next slide. And it's going to look fairly similar to things that come in the future. Um, the the, the first really expensive uh, video game, or sorry, arcade game, because it's not on a CRT screen, um, is from 1966. Yes, Sega has been around for a really long time. So has Nintendo. Um, the Periscope submarine simulator is the first one that cost a quarter. Now, the thing is, back then, a quarter was actually a significant amount of change. Um, Sega had this... Um, uh, tendency is not the right word, but they had this predilection to making mechanical and electronic games. So they released Periscope, they released Duck Hunt, um, and a whole like until what we think of as a video game era they release a lot of like hand-eye coordination games and such so that center lower uh picture is of the brown box gaming console which um is the first actual gaming console and they still have it I, this is in the museum and i'm forgetting which one offhand um in the upper left hand corner that is the machine that is the first sports simulator game of baseball um and that uh, space war machine is down in the lower left. 1970s. Um, again, we start seeing a lot of change, the change in technology driving the accessibility of electronic gaming. Um, 
this is the original um uh the the era where oregon trail which is something i remember from the 80s it was actually originally played with a teletype machine and i've got a screenshot of what some of that will um, output looked like so it, 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 instead of having the little ASCII animations and such it was completely text-based you didn't have a screen output you it printed you with it printed you your update <laughs> um that brown box from the 60s turns into the odyssey by magnavox that Space War game turns into the first arcade video game cabinet, although it definitely looks very different from the ones in the 80s, as you'll see in a moment. And this is also 1972 is when Pong is invented. And I've heard some people refer to it as like, wait, wasn't that a desk, like a computer? console desktop game is like actually it was first developed as a arcade game and on its first day it stopped working because too many people were trying to play it and jammed it too full of quarters to run and then later was told, turned into a desktop game a lot of stuff happened in the 70s so there's actually a uh three slides in this part um we have computer magazines coming out showing how to write games um we have sorry uh, um we have some people starting to work more on what we now think of as virtual reality things in 1975, there's actually a um, program called Video Place that lets people um, interact with virtual ob objects. Oh, um, so Pong, which was so incredibly popular as a arcade cabinet game, no toy company would touch a console version of it so they had to go through sears and robux catalog for sporting goods to distribute it and well it became extremely popular and they were justified in any giggling they may have indulged in when going to the game companies the next time for support in the 70s, we also see some of the first text-based games and Paving the Way for Zork, which most people have heard of, and other text-based role-playing games. In the 70s is when Atari starts coming into its own um as a company and develops and drops the atari 2600 onto the market and it was extremely popular likewise space invaders comes into the scene which is one of the longest running most popular games in terms of the early part of video gaming um and the game companies start taking like in, in, instead of the game companies themselves like mattel start taking electronic games and electronic gaming more seriously so in this slide up in the upper left hand corner we see a still shot of the game of uh the game of life that one kind of in the middle is computer space and the machines were actually released in four different colors in a, this fiberglass 
casing to make it all cool and futuristic whereas pong the console the cabinet next to it you can tell that someone had more money in their budget for design aesthetics than someone else but we don't hear of computer space anymore we all have heard of pong lower left hand corner is that cop that um a a printout of Oregon Trail and a shout out to Space Invaders and Atari. There's a number of names that are going to be seen again and again and again. We've got Sega and they've been around for ages. Sega, Atari, um, Nintendo. Speaking of Nintendo, uh, well, we now come into the 80s where we have things like Pac-Man. We have calculators that people are able to, that calculators people have in their home that are now getting sophisticated enough that they can be programmed like computers. Um, we also, this is also where we get Um, this is also where we start getting, um, uh, Legend of Zelda, sorry, part two, exactly. Um, the, we've got Nintendo coming out with the NES. We have <clears throat> some of our first, um, like our first football game coming out. Um, SimCity coming out. Um, interchangeable cartridges as opposed, um, and discs as the <clears throat> um, as the holder for games we have Tetris coming out at this time and I did not realize that this is what Tetris looked like at the beginning I I remember Tetris on one of my first computers and it was just a little more sophisticated than that In the 90s, uh, more and more computers, more and more people playing games. Um, we start seeing the questions of video game violence starting to pop up. Um, also, some of the questions about representation of women in games popping up. Um, we start even getting um, uh, like uh, for violence, we start getting in Senate hearings on our games bad for our kids, that sort of thing. But we also get the first PlayStation. And this is when Sony edges Sega out of the home console, console business because they just did that well. As I was saying for in the 90s, um, we, uh, representation of women is this is when Tomb Raider comes out and there's a wait, is she realistic enough, et cetera, um, debate starting. Back in the 60s, we had a check, sorry, back in the 50s to 60s, we had a checkers program that be a professional now in the 90s is when Deep Blue beats uh, <coughs> beats the world chess champion. Um, and again, a couple of pictures. 
we're starting to get a little slow on time, so I'm going to try to uh, speed up my pace. Um, so we had Sims and other simulation games before. 2000 is when we get the first Sims game with its little iconic diamond floating over everyone's heads. The Xbox comes out. Um, there's, I did not realize that Steam was this old. Twitch is also older than I think, than I had thought. We start getting a lot more fan based um, pushes for conventions and such rather than industry conventions. So we get our first Versa uh, packs. Um, Rock Band comes out in the 2000s. World of Warcraft goes over 10 million subscribers. Towards the end of the decade, as our cell phones get more complicated and able to process things, we start getting social games, Farmville, Angry Birds. And now we are still kind of stuck to our phone screens from time to time and how many times have you watched a YouTube video and Raid of Shadow Legends has an ad in it. Um, <laughs> and oh yeah the Nintendo DS comes out it, it just there's this snowballing that's happening with um, that's continuing on with the technology and how games had been a yes it's only in a computer lab in a research facility in a college because that's where it is or it's only in this arcade where you have to go during certain times when it's um when the arcades open because the machines are so large and now the games are starting to fit in our pockets In the 2010s, we get um, a little bit of a throwback with the graphics of Minecraft. Yes, I know. Stop it. <laughs> Sorry, that's my alarm. Um, we start getting um, much more real-time physical um, interaction with between games and the outside world. Um, we start getting the Oculus Rift and a lot more, even fit, even though some of the attempts have failed, a lot more, can we make virtual reality and therefore virtual reality games a real concern at this point? Have we, has the technology caught up to the, imagination um we get also uh, as the gaming community has gotten older we start also seeing some much more mature games um like yes we had leisure suit larry back in the 80s and 90s but now it's that was kind of more of a tongue-in-cheek laughing thing whereas now we've got things like last of us where it's uh pretty dark and grim post-apocalyptic zombie craze in the games as well as in the in our in our movies and other forms of entertainment um 2014 launches uh, niantic launches ingress Many people haven't heard of Ingress, but they have heard of Pokemon Go and Wizards Unite, which are, <laughs> which are in that same, you know, based on the same technology. Um, uh, then we start getting, um, this is when the Nintendo, that past decade is when Nintendo Switch came out. Um, for Microsoft actually developed a really awesome controller that lets um, 
people with disabilities and other needs um, kind of more program the console controls to what they need to be able to play, which I really need to do a lot more research on because that's fascinating. And 2019 um, is the first time I have ever seen a game company actually destroy their world, restart, and yes, there are some grumblings, but actually start to make more money as a result, uh, which is what happened with Fortnite. Um, speaking of Fortnite and the asteroid coming to kill us all and start a chapter two. Um, so that brings us to, to 2020. We're in the first year of this, well, not quite decade, depending on you, how you determine your decades and centuries, but it's 2020. It's still the first half of 2020. And gaming as a whole is now relying a lot more on electronics because of the pandemic. Um, I am <laughs> I am seeing um, a lot of people turning to electronic gaming as a way of keeping their wits about them and um, keeping in contact with people. We've got everything from we have um, Discord you be, and Google Hangouts and, and other and Slack being used to coordinate games. If you're into RPGs, uh, there's a couple of there's online tools for playing. And some of these things have been around for a while, but now it's just like, whereas like, Six months ago, I knew people who maybe played online once or twice within the past previous year. They're now playing two to three times a week online. For board games, there are some mobile platforms for playing different types of games. There's also Jackbox games. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're getting close enough. I do see a question of, um, do you think we'll see more esports because of COVID nineteen? Um, yeah, I I believe we will because particularly if there's a if we can if that gap between using hand controls and using VR controls, I think COVID nineteen might push some companies to put more effort into developing that because. Um, while there's a lot of people interested in esports, and I was at PAX East, and my gods, the number of people playing various and sundry esports on computer and console, um, I think our VR is starting to get to that extra little point where we might be seeing more physically, like, um ah sorry i'm losing my voice uh, and my words um i think covid-19 is going to push that next stage of development um we've got a 2 minute warning so um is there any i didn't i have not seen any questions top come on um I am not seeing anything that's come up in the Q&A, um, but if there's any burning questions someone would like to ask now, um, go ahead. Otherwise, I'll be, after a small break, going into the Discord ch uh, chat uh, for BottleCon and people can ask questions and give insights and comments um, and, 
thank you. I haven't done a presentation like this since probably I was in college mumbly years ago, and I hope everyone found something that they could enjoy from that. Thank you much. <laughs> oh my goodness. I hope everyone <laughs> I hope everyone's going to have a good rest of the con. I'll share that.